uh, welcome uh, to the first session of AI as Disinformation Engine, Exploring the Deep Fake State by Tony Yannick. Uh, in less than half a decade, the world has witnessed the rise of the synthetic media and the <clears throat> deep fake, near human level generation of text, image, video, speech, and music generation. Uh, last year reached a critical mass of generational apophenia and growing fears of deceptive fictions. Techno-aesthetic fakery as a political tool. Uh, is AI remaking the world without us? And uh, this will be the paradigm we will approach in a non-disciplinary manner, part computational epistemology, part computer science, and the practical lab component in which we will experiment with state-of-the-art models in operation. Uh, the course does not require any specific background. All disciplines are welcome as this technology is pervasive and its influence complex. Uh, the format of this course will be separated into seminar lab debriefing groups. Much of the course will be in a group discussion online with the instructor and invited experts. The seminar sessions are aimed to provide the proper context of each coding lab session. The reading for the course will be diverse, from reading computer, uh, computer science articles, exploring audiovisual archives, as well as technical documentation and developer tutorials. Each reading will prepare you for the labs where we collectively break into the black boxes of machine learning models. The debriefing uh, sections include writing responses, sharing with the group, and contributing to collective documentation. Lab sessions will be offered. The skill set of each participant will determine the piece of the sessions and what we can accomplish. We will provide the basic knowledge of training model-based machine learning, model architecture, custom data sets, fine-tuning hyperparameters. Uh, the focus will be on more recent approaches like generative adversarial networks, deep dream again, and reinforcement learning. Open AI world models will be the focus. We encourage the participation of those with no coding experience. A genuine interest in the technology is the only requirement. They will be step-by-step -step tutorials to get everyone through. Coders also are also welcome, difficulty adjustable. Uh, synthetic media is an emerging challenge at speed and scale. It, it seeps into all of our lives. Literacy and agency are, if not will be, imperative and they will meta theoretically construct the core tenets of the past as we foray into the world of generative aesthetics. Uh, Tony Yannick is a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Glasgow in film philosophy and holds a Master of Science in Computer Engineering, Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. His work focuses on the intersection between philosophy, aesthetics and ethics, but also includes research in new media political economy and technology. So I'm now going to pass the mic to Tony. Yeah, um, just one thing, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not in Glasgow anymore. This is okay, it's just, it's a, a, a old bio, but uh, I'm in Buffalo right now. I'm doing a PhD uh, in media arts. So it's a kind of between an art practice and a media study. So a lot of the work, that I want to talk about and I want to go over um, during the course is kind of the questions that I'm asking myself and hopefully I can like uh, bounce ideas off. We can create some, um, some good conversations. I have to apologize for the first session. It's going to be the most, uh, probably the most robotic, the most annoying and the most boring. Um, because I have to do a lot of like, you know, hey, what, what's up? Uh, you know, I'm weird when I give lectures too, by the way. So that's another obvious thing. Um, let's say, um, I'm not gonna do introductions. I want you guys, I'm gonna have you guys, um, I'm gonna take a, we're gonna take a break halfway through and then I'm going to share a Google doc and I just want everybody to kind of just put their name and like one line down and we'll talk about it after. Um, but I do want to kind of open the conversation before I kind of get into it with just briefly, if we can just have uh, the people in the room kind of come on and just give me like, I don't know if you want to talk about like a project that you're working on or why you're interested in AI or why you're frustrated with it or anything. Um, that would be great. Just give me a little, uh, a little uh, boost before I start talking for too long. Um, so I'll just, uh, James, can you introduce yourself? 
or just briefly give me a little bit of background. Thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm James McDowell. Uh, my interest is in uh, generative aesthetics and the automated generation of artworks, whether it's visual or uh, literary. Okay, cool. Uh, next, Florian. Hey, I'm Florian. I'm a theater director, and I'm really like, I really don't have like any literacy in coding and that's super frustrating and needs to be changed. Thank you. Okay. Graham. Oh, hey, I'm Graham. Um, yeah, I guess my interest in sort of deep fakes actually comes from uh, an interest in like non line of sight imaging. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's sort of okay. AI so like, image. Maybe. Yeah, but aerial stuff like panoptic kind of imagery. Uh, panoptic imagery, like a 3D scene reconstruction from a single image, um, mm -hmm. those types of things. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Zenobia? Hey, hey everyone, I'm, I'm Zenobia, a designer uh, and researcher based in, in Brazil. I am very interested in, in speculative design and generative design also, and I'm, I'm I'm hoping the seminar to learn some tools and techniques dealing with AI, although I'm, I'm, I'm very in the beginning of, of learning coding and etc. Okay. Uh, Roman? Hi, uh, Roman, um, uh, based in uh, the Netherlands, Amsterdam, um, working in uh, information studies. Uh, quite some students that I know uh, write uh, stuff about uh, um, the generative uh, adversarial networks modeling. So I was quite interested in uh, those uh, other uh, ways such as world models uh, mentioned here. So, uh, and these different uh, parts uh, towards uh, understanding uh, uh, deep fakes. Yeah, especially because, I mean, the information field, uh, you, you're kind of, yeah, the information field's a little bit behind, uh, probably behind, but also in, you kind of have the forensics as well. So like the like old for old forensic technology is with image processing. Uh, we're from informatics technology. So, uh, but like yes, the generative stuff is all these models are really changing the nature of information right now too. So I think it's it's really a good place to be. Um, Tegan. Hi, I'm Tegan. Um, I'm really interested in sort of sensory and data mutation at the moment, and so sort of hoping to take this as almost an instruction into sort of doing it on the digital side rather than always with some sort of physical um, interventions. Mm -hmm. And then biosignals or any sensor, any any external uh, environmental. Which was one? That? Oh, um, mostly I've been sort of posing things as sort of like, like the camera, like techno prosthetics that we use to sense the environment, whether it's recording devices or sort of cameras, sort of ways that we can intervene with that both physically and then now hopefully um, digitally through code. Okay, yeah, because this is, I mean, yeah, as we all know, I mean, this is our, our we have the, and most people have a smartphone or some technology that is already doing everything for, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous the amount of information that these companies have over us. Um, and the access is like, yeah, this idea of black box is, uh, yeah, so let me introduce that really quickly. I mean, like the idea of the black box, right, is the fact that the technology gets like, it gets so small and so almost immaterial, so small that they become like uh, built into IC chips and then into phones. And we consider them black boxes because we can input them, we get outputs, but we don't really understand what's going on between it. Um, and the reason why I want to talk, why I wanted to say that really quickly, is because a lot of times when we, when when you hear about machine learning and deep learning, um, you're going to hear the rhetoric of black box. And I think this is a this this is um, from outside of a technical field. It's a difficult thing because um, if you take it from outside, we're thinking like in terms of the way I just described it. But for them, it's very technical. Uh, there are certain functional practices that are called black box auditing. So when you hear the word black box, um, 
you can't really think of it as something you can't really understand because these uh, these networks, as I hope that we can start to discuss in the next couple of sessions, um, they're actually quite transparent. It's just the fact that they're really complex. So it's the complexity of it that makes it difficult for us to understand, but we can access almost every part of it. So it's a lot of that. This is like that setup can tangent into a lot of things like you can think about like the fact that, you know, artificial when you think of a machine learning artificial intelligence uh the first thing people want to say is like oh yeah thinking bots everything's thinking um and that this is a can be a really difficult thing and i think this is one of the issues of the black box if we don't understand it we can just then um anthropomorphize it think of it as thinking whereas this a lot of machine learning and deep learning where it has this um scale of wanting to be AGI, artificial general intelligence, or, you know, conceptual symbolic AI. Um, that's what you'll hear in a lot of theory. Like it's immediately theory. Uh, okay, so what I'm finding is that theory uh, and these and, and generative networks, they have two theoretical kind of interests. One is like, uh, the social critical one, which I think is pretty interesting. You'll find Mateo's text and a few other texts in the syllabus. Um, and those are important, like thinking of how we have to structure these things in the future and now what, what they possibly can do. And then you have the other one, which I do find interesting, and I, uh, but it's the AGI one, which I think is can get very dangerous. It's good for a philosophical conceptual model, but when you quickly say, oh, everything, we're just going to create these things that are going to spin off. And it's so close to where we are. I hope to, con I hope to be able to convey or show you a little bit about it that uh, it's actually quite constrained by us. Humans are very constrained. We constrain every single thing about it. And that's why there are hundreds of models all doing the exact same problem all from very idiosyncratic positions, right? Nothing is really universal, uh, even though they are general algorithms. So I know it's like very convoluted in what I just said, but it, I'll start, I'll tease it out as we go. But really, this is one of the things I think that we have to start thinking about as, uh, as because uh, I'm trying to take like a non-technical position to this. Um, it's a lot of things we have to think about uh, when we approach these things is is like the care of the, the language that they're using. Because we're going to start to say, I'm going to start to show you a lot of things and the models and stuff that use words to name it that don't really describe it. They just metaphorically relate. Anyways, sorry for the tangent, uh, but uh, Veronica? Yeah, so um, I'm... Uh... New Media Studies student and my focus uh, is actually on like digital surfaces and CGI animation, but I uh, think in part it's course because I have some basic intro to AI uh, at my faculty, but I would like to learn like something more than just like basic introduction. So maybe how to use it and how to like appropriate it, some technique for my work, which would be nice because I have no idea how to do it. Okay. So uh, to, yeah, just a quick response to what you triggered there is that, um, yeah, I hope that we're going to be able to, and we'll start to talk about it at the end of this session, but I want to be able to work, uh, we'll continually work on like a single project as we kind of tinker in demos. So the project uh, that you guys can all pick, whatever, it can be as simple or complex as you want, but uh, the, this, you know, this will be a good uh, way for you to kind of challenge me Veronica to kind of provide you with the skill and where you want to go so if you so when we come to that project uh, problem you can conceptualize um, with the sort of context you can give it a context and we can try to get there um, a lot of these a lot of the software too is um, you know plug and play now I mean a lot of the software if you can just access these I'll just show you very quickly. Um, uh, this window up. But um, so a lot of them are in collabs. 
So this is actually like Google hosts free GPU servers. So, okay, so this will be a thing. I, if you use the new center account, it should be fine. I think when I was in Russia, I only had a problem getting credits, not, not accessing it. So it should be fine. Um, but uh, this is like the, the way I'll kind of offer all the code. And so if I can show you like, <laughs> yeah, so let me just, one moment, sorry. All right, I'll, I'll bring it up after the break, but sorry. Um, there apologize it's going to be a little bit before i get a hold of my own control um but the collabs are they're called notebooks you'll get all the code will be shared in there and you can literally most of the time as long as there's not interactive behavior but most of them you should be able to just click on run all and it will run the software so we're going to and and, and the way the software works is it in, in a notebook is you um, execute code uh, in modules. So you can like write a little bit of code, execute it to see if it works, then continue. So um, it's actually quite nice because you can walk through every step of what's happening. So I hope that will help you be able to at least be able to, I, don't, I, I can't get, I mean, I'm not gonna guarantee anybody is gonna be able to be like a coder at the end of this course, but you'll be able to access and, uh, and, and um, at least, through the black box example I gave originally, you'll be able to input things and get things out. So we'll see how far I can get in four sessions for the rest of it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna totally screw up your name. I'm sorry, but Scott, Scott, can you pronounce your name first? Georgia, the name I'm is Georgia. <laughs> George, ah, yeah. Uh, okay. Hi everyone. Hi. Uh, I'm a, I'm from Greece and currently living in Greece. I'm oh, a digital artist. Diverse. Yes, <laughs> uh, I I already have some experience with uh, machine learning applications. Uh, I have worked mainly with uh, Disney and uh, image captioning. Okay. Uh, my interest uh, with those projects was uh, around uh, processing and distribution of visual information, so like big archives of images and uh, correlations between them and such stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, through this project and through some readings and stuff, now my research has shifted to mostly the culture behind AI, uh, the concept of uh, generative uh, algorithms, and if there's such a term of true generation, not just combinatorics and statistical induction and stuff. So yes, that's where I am right now. And I'm very excited. Yeah. In the context of my research, I guess that kind of kind of runs into yours is like the way I kind of conceptualize that is like a truly cre creativity is like the, the evaluation or something, or is it correct evaluation of, of uh, true generativity? You know, you're asking about true generative Whereas these, I mean, because yes, these are very, these are basically mathematical operations and functions that are running uh, in asynchronous. Uh, they, they run differently than our brain works, although they're mapped like our brain, but the way that we cognitively process information. So we don't, under, so it seems like it's doing something uh, very unique, but per, a lot of times, yeah, no, they aren't truly generative. Um, and I think also there's a good interest. There's good interest in the um, like the uh, the original like Ben's like the original art like generative artists like uh, the difference between that kind of theory and like what's happening now, which is like I think quite different um, than the like '60s generative artists. Did you say original? Do you say you worked with Disney? Disney? No, Disney, the algorithm. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yes, that's a uh, visualization of like um, of uh, principal components. So, um, TS and E, 
what she said here. It's, it's like this or, or anything. Uh, but um, so uh, your model learns a certain, so let's assume that you're doing a classification model and a very simple one uh, that classifies between dogs and cats. And this is like a very simple uh, algorithm. Um, so after, after your model learns, then you can then process, you can process information on what it knows. And then there, like this idea of visualizing through TSNE is probably the one that you see the most if you like Google search um, any kind of visualization. But it's a, um, it's a spatial representation of closeness of, com of the features. So depending on how, what features you want, but you'd be able to see like how things cluster and group in space uh, based on large data sets. So I was, um, the one thing I wanted to mention to you, Giorgio, is that uh, was looking at this algorithm clip, OpenAI's new uh, language application that um, is, it goes from text to, it, it um, finds, the, it, it's modeled on the relationship between text and image. So, you can actually now have like a full video archive and then access every point in the video based on language. So you can type fire truck in like a database of this many videos and it will tell you every point where the fire truck is or things like this. Uh, so, and I like clip a lot. I think it's quite fun. And that will be like, we'll, we'll talk, we'll actually introduce that in the last session. Um, but it's very fun. It's like a semantic uh, access to any model and you can just talk to it natural language and it kind of can give you what you want. But there are a lot of limited, like, so um, you, like one of the limitations of this, like of, of these models like CLIP is that they're trained on, they're, they're really nice because they're given to you for free. They're trained on a whole bunch of data but the problem is that they're trained on internet data. So the information that you're gonna get back is like a very skewed amount, even though it's like very widely general, you're gonna get a very skewed amount of what like, I mean, most, a lot of clip is trained on Reddit forums. If you can think of like, that's the culture that this model is. So it might, it seems very vast, but it's, um, ah, yeah, sorry, no, we're, we were talking, I'm, I'm just talking about points uh, as we go, as people are introducing themselves. So it's a slow introduction. So yeah, it is supposed to be, it, everybody's gonna be disor disoriented in the first session, I think, including me. And then I will catch, I always catch on the, the second session, third session, fourth are always really good with my, my courses. Um, okay, who do we have next? Do we have, I'm also going to pronounce your name wrong. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Nikisani. Nikisani. I don't know how. Uh, Hello. <laughs> I'm um, terrible with pronouncing names. <laughs> it's all right. Ah, it's, it's right. okay. Um, yeah, my name is Kinsani. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm interested in. Um, oh, I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. That's where I am right now. Um, I'm interested in like AI and music um okay. improvisation that kind of thing like can improvisation be programmed you know mm -hmm. um yeah i think primarily like that's what i'm here for um okay. i'm very interested in that yeah okay yeah it's i mean and music has always been like the forefront of these 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 uh models and i and and I'll, i i'm also a musician uh working a lot with this stuff so yeah uh, you'll get a lot of i'll, I'll have a lot of music in uh re references just because of my own interests but um the one that i think is very in another man i'm like an open ai uh advertisement today but um the open ai has this thing called jukebox it's like state of the art model for uh, music generation and i could do really cool things also one of the things i'm going to show that we can work on but you can you can like say you want it there are a bunch of trained models of artists and genres. And you can basically like say you want Wu-Tang Clan 
in a children's song genre and then you can generate it will start to generate you can like feed it right now i'm doing three six mafia doing a brush your teeth children's song you know um i always thought this would be the best song ever so it's like really what i'm doing but um it that doesn't you know so it tries basically it takes the three layers it takes a top layer which is um which is its highest level of information and that it's like it's uh basically it's like um i feed it lyrics and that top level is the lyrics so it tries to uh get it tries to find every point in say three six mafia's vocals that could have said that word and it tries to like uh synthesize those those words second layer takes the genre uh that i input uh the third layer is the is the genre of the artist so this so as it goes you can control three layers of of music actually it's kind of interesting so clip is very cool uh or jukebox is a very cool thing you can go online i think it's like jukebox explorer sample explorer you can see a bunch of examples uh atofa i'm gonna pronounce everybody's name wrong let's just do it wrong every time uh hello hello everyone uh, i'm sorry i came in a bit late and i'm a little bit disoriented today but uh yes i'm Atafa. you can call me ati i'm uh originally from iran and now i'm based in poland i actually study gender studies and uh my background is mostly in art uh, uh, performance and like I've studied theater and I do a little bit of uh, uh, painting and drawing myself but I uh, see myself ending up in I don't know media arts or generative arts so I, I, I saw this as a good chance to more uh, get uh, more engaged in uh, the actual logic of thing not like stand outside of it and think about it and just uh, mm -hmm. because it said that it that like in the course syllabus it said that you don't need any background in coding and i nope. said like it's it's a good place to start actually to yeah, dive okay. myself into the into the practical uh, matter or technical matter. And I, I always wanted to learn coding and I didn't get um, uh, like uh, like uh, anywhere on my own. So I thought it, it's a good start to do mm -hmm. it here. So happy okay. to be here. Great. Um, also for the people who don't know coding, uh, I can, I'm gonna be, I can provide like really good um, ways that you could uh, approach it after this course too like the like from what i found from teaching it uh what's the easiest way which, which is like this this is like a you can you can learn through like a visual um uh recursion like you basically do very small parts of coding you see what happens uh you figure and you learn how to abstract uh everything into visuals and it's pretty easy um so like for that i mean like there's there's a platform processing which maybe people know um which is like geared towards artists and is very visually based and quite simple little as aspects so like it's what it's where to go like once you start to get your gears into and you like uh really want to write stuff that's like one of the best ways to start um and so uh alan hi i'm alan i'm from Mexico, and I'm about to start a PhD on uh, like Marx's readings of automation and machine learning. So I have no, um, I mean, I've just approached machine learning from like the critical theory side, but I have no like technical knowledge or or, or coding knowledge. So okay. yeah, it's like a good place to start delving into a thing before I start. And I, I assume you have read the Mateo stuff. Matteo Pasquinelli stuff already. Yeah, yeah, he's like one of the main like kind of uh, theoretical frameworks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're gonna. That would be a lot of the next sessions talks will be um, one of his articles and kind of going over his stuff because I think he does. He uh, along with a group of people started have started uh, what they're calling like a critical. What are they calling it? Critical model 
like a critical model study or something, which I find really interesting. Just like like getting deep diving into the modeling of, of, of AI and that so it's like critical model dot AI or something. It's like a newsletter, a news list. It's worth checking out. Um, and we have one last one, Shifty. Maybe. Okay. If you come in, I'll let you interrupt. Just interrupt me. It's okay. All right. So good. Ah, do you want to? Oh, did, tell did you say my name? Yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't. I didn't recognize it. Yeah, um, I didn't recognize it either. So don't worry. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, I'm a designer based in India, and since the past few months, I've been exploring uh, Playform, and uh, I uh, uh, I hope to be introduced to uh, more visual AI and uh, literary AI, which is uh, friendly to non-coders. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, so we're we're gonna for those of sorry, for the people that do have some coding or or um, might have some things, some things might be a little slow, but there'll be like asynchronous conversations, and um, if there is, uh, let me preempt. Uh, if there is exercises or something that are below. A skill level, you're, you're bored with them, just we can talk about that and kind of figure out how to uh, cater to each person. Because I, I want to be able to like also, like I'm teaching these kind of uh, speaking to the void course, even though you're all there, I see you. But, but, but you know, I'm trying to, I want to cater to each one, um, kind of like thread through and see if we can. Um, okay, I will post the critic. It's, what is it called? Let me just look for it real quick. I know it's on it's on there like it's on their academic like on the his university website okay i will remind me but i'll find it during the break so i don't waste time here but because like yeah it's not here um i'll find it and post it post the course all right um yeah, so anyway, so I'm going to try to thread everything through. Um, and, you know, hopefully some things, I mean, I expect things to probably go over people's heads, including mine when I'm, you know, I'm, I've had to repeat the read and write these, read these things over and over again. Um, and yeah, I'm not really expressing myself as an expert, but I'm somebody who knows a lot and I want to kind of share it. Um, and I hope to also learn from all of you. So yeah uh like please yeah all models thank you um please interrupt me anytime uh i don't find anything like that rude uh it's better to have a discussion and a conversation so if there's something that i'm saying that doesn't make any sense just just, just interrupt me um so today we're just going to kind of briefly go over um like the general idea of what i want to kind of uh talk about and uh, I'm going to introduce some concepts that I'm going to have to talk about that are involved in the architecture of the code. And we'll, we'll break and then have a wrap up discussion uh, where we talk about like what we want to get out of this, like what we all want to do in this course in terms of like a project. And then we'll discuss how to proceed with the next four weeks. So um, I'm just going to kind of read off this, these notes I made, right? So um so we all know that like one moment all right um, apologies I have to set this up better. I have my two screens and it's just not working out too well. All 
Okay, can it be red? Should I make it bigger? Bigger, please. Yeah. Better? Or just go full screen? I can just go full screen, doesn't matter. Um, Okay, so yeah, so just to kind of go, this is like the, the, the brief document that was proposed by, you know, many of the people that you hear a lot about, but the main, main one here is Claude Shannon. Uh, this is the proposal for the Dartmouth Sunray Research. This is kind of like 1955, where AI is actually termed, where it's invented. Actually, also where a lot of the ideas we're going to talk about were also already thought about pretty much this. We haven't really gotten past like the things that they've kind of predicted in this first, I think the first five, 10 years. Um, the way that AI history goes is quite interesting. Uh, maybe I'll share like a, like, a di like a diagram with you, but the way that they kind of um, they've been building, they, there's kind of like different waves. There's different waves of AI. Um, and at, at this point, they're talking about what is called symbolic AI. Um, and I will get to this here. All right, so good old fashioned AI is what it's called, but it's like the first form of AI. So when people kind of discuss uh, AI in general, um, you know, the most basic level, which was like very famous up until about the, let's say 80s, 90s, a little bit later, uh, is good old fashioned AI, right? This is like where we can basically symbolically represent um, a problem domain and we can represent them in a set of if then else statements. So this is conditional statements. Um, if you've ever done like a choose your own adventure novel where you have choices and you can go left or right, this is pretty much like how AI was. You would know through a set of questions how to come to a, um, how to come to an answer. So this is used a lot in businesses and a lot with databases and a lot of so um, this is how kind of like a, uh, a lot of the original stuff stuff happened. The only reason I'm saying that is just because if you're involved in the kind of I have to give you, slight background because these kind of top these kind of topics get brought up right so this kind of intelligence is explicitly programmed by a human it's already come to it given the map and we call these maps like rule engines um knowledge graphs or the big one is quote unquote symbolic ai uh this is kind of like what is known as the first wave of AI, which is uh, all about the symbolic rules. So we don't have anything where the machine is like actually doing anything of intelligence. It's just kind of retrieving information. Kind of, I'm just quickly getting you brought up to machine learning here. But here we have a diagram of um, kind of where people were going um, when uh, there was this kind of a second wave or the second trend at the same time, which was biologically inspired uh, AI, which took things like simple prog, um, it took simple agents like a uh, cockroach. And a cockroach uh, has like a, a simple light, dark kind of sensor where it will always kind of go towards the dark. So they were first modeled cockroaches, ants, or other animals that they would, things that had these very, very simple um, uh, ways to go. Actually, the school that I did my PhD, my, my robotics degree at, like, did these cockroach robots. They're, they're, they're very dumb. All they can do is, they basically just avoid light. It's pretty easy, right? Um, but so this is getting involved now with that there is like some kind of a feedback mechanism. Everybody kind of seen some kind of diagram like this, right? Where you have a conditional, like here we have a conditional uh, rules. This is the same as the symbolic AI, right? But we can produce actions and we can then perceive in the environment what happens. And that's our feedback to the environment. And 
we can then that here is, is a simple feedback loop. So what is the world like now? Kind of feeds back into our current action. So they took this model, okay, and they started to do agent, agent environments. So again, they can perceive, they can act on it. Um, and then this term like autonomous started coming in. Um, if something is autonomous, that is sim that is the technological word for if uh, there is a human attached to it, right? If you have a semi-autonomous, that means that there's some collaboration with the human uh, fully operated uh, machine, basically. Uh, automaton is like, uh, you know, a machine that you just can control fully. So autonomous is kind of the language here. But um, yeah, so then you have the more recent one, which is like the one that people kind of see more, which is what I'm saying, the biologically inspired. So we, when we, we started thinking about, we started thinking about uh, these small and simple examples. And then we started to model, then came, which came very early on, but that came the model of the artificial neural network. Which is a very simple network that was modeled off of the way that we understood the brain at the time. So this is the essential model here um, where you have a set of inputs on your right, on your left, most side here. These circle, this first uh, row of circles are what are called weights. And that basically is like a bias. Humans are biased all the time, right? We have a bias uh, towards something so we perceive it that way, that's our way of perceiving. So we can actually weigh, it's called, you know, we can give it a certain amount of weight to kind of give it more uh, value in, 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 the, in the neuron. Um, then here is what's considered a transfer function, okay? Um, and the activation function and you have an activation. So this is like a lot of technical terms and it doesn't mean that we don't need to learn them all. I'm just gonna kind of give you the narrative. I mean, but your transfer, a transfer function here, we're gonna skip that because it's not, we're not gonna discuss that anymore. Um, but it's essentially, I mean, it's just the way that you, you, that it's transitioning for to be an input, but the activation function is most interesting because the activation function is a simple, binary, which means uh, yes or no, zero or one uh, answer based on a certain threshold. So um, there are different activation functions and they are, the activation functions become actually essentially at this time, the most important part of the research because they're all different ways to kind of um, to model it. So if you think of uh, in Photoshop, you have a uh, in Photoshop, you have like a threshold um, filter, right? And you can kind of adjust the threshold filter on, on your black and white uh, pixels and it'll show you more, more or less information, right? And this is, a, this is just like the abstraction of, of what these, these do. Um, what's really odd about the neural, what's really odd about the neural network, which I, is, is that, um, I mean, these things are a digit. They're just essentially values and numbers that may or may not correlate to the real world, but they're very abstract because they just represent these like uh, numbers below the value of one. So they're all just decimal, decimal numbers that have no, no understanding. So at this time, this is a very black box. We have no idea what's going on. We have just, uh, this ability to 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 modif mod modify the activation function. Um, so you have the so a lot of times in code uh, because you have so the software is written um, it's written linearly right like a book, but it's accessed uh, recursively meaning it it's accessed all different types of, different lines in the page. So the, so the way that they describe that code running is the flow, the directional flow that information is going through the network. So that's how we're gonna to start to describe the network, right? Um, 
on a basic neural network, you have two flows. You have feed forward network, right? And you have a feedback network. These are both pretty obvious, right? But they, uh, your feed forward network means that um, information only goes left to right from input to output and you never know, you can never have, um, you never know anything about the information. Um, but then we have uh, feedbacks, right? Uh, back propagation is one of them, which will, I will, you'll hear the word again very soon. Um, but this is like, they call them recurrent networks. Um, recursive is another way of describing it. But it's when they actually have an internal state of memory. So each neuron, each, each, um, each point of the flow, there's actually like a memory of what has occurred. So you can actually feed back information so it can adjust based on its memory. And this is how we've built very basic training to, um, to teach or to basically to when, when neural networks learn, all of these neurons basically have a certain memory and they're being adjusted and adapted until they reach a point where their connections um, make some kind of semantics, some kind of sense to us, whether it's visual or it proves a problem or something on the, on the other side, and then we can freeze it. So these flows are important. You have to kind of know uh, where they go. If anything, you're going to hear the words. So just in, just to giving you a little bit. Again, more language. Um, but everybody's seen this, I'm sure. At least uh, something like this model. This is like the church flow end model, um, where we can start to see, or where we get a little bit more uh, information. And this one is not going left to right, as you can see by this. It's going. Uh, it's a hierarchical network. Um, I think is a this is actually quite better representation too because of the. Um, kind of uh, integration. Anyways, sorry. Um, Lordy, so what I want to say here is that this is like, now these are the prime, these are prime vocab or prime language what we'll be using all the time when we talk about uh, any neural network. Okay, but each one of the circles here obviously represents a, a neuron. Um, the ones here on the top, this layer here are the output units. This middle layer here is the hidden units. Okay, and I'll explain why they're called hidden. Uh, the top, the bottom layer is the uh, input units. Flow of information is going in a vertical direction. Um, so, uh, and, and and these arrows here are the they're called um, the they're called synaptic connections based on the synaps synapses in the brain, but they're basically. Um, the way that these neurons connect to each other build specific architectures, specific structures um, that become common and start to become building blocks for the for the next. Like what a deep, this is basically the model for a deep learning neural network. But the only difference is that the hidden units here are multiple layers and there are a lot of hidden layers so the um the way that that was it was kind of formalized this 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 uh input output hidden that's the black box model right the input units the hidden the hidden units and the output and the reason why they're called hidden is because we have no that we as in the when i say we are and I'm, I'm thinking of the programmer but we have no internal access to uh, what's happening in the hidden neurons or no access of, of adjusting them uh, in operation. And we don't, none of the other neurons know, just that they only know the input and the output and the hidden ones uh, do their thing. And so what we'll find is that like the, the changing in hidden neuron, hidden layers are basically the different, a lot of different models coming up to um, deep learning. So like they're just like they're, and we'll, the way I'm going to, that I describe these things are very much like these schematic diagrams. So 
um, I hope that this is just again like a will be repeated and remembered. Um, the arrows also represent a weight. So um, a connection also carries with it a weight. So it's if you, anybody is familiar with a vector in mathematics, right? A vector in mathematics has a direction and a magnitude. And that's the same idea of these, these here. So it carries a connection and where it has information, it passes it to another neuron, but it not only does that, but it passes it with a certain bias. So almost like a, a telephone game or a exquisite corpse or you know, some game where, where you're passing this information, but it's getting like changed at each bias. And uh, so then this is where, this is like the amount of abstraction that they understood. And the rest of it became very experimental and a, a lot of tinkering. And we're gonna approach these again, this is just like an introduction to a lot of the visuals and the language. I just kind of want to cruise through a lot of this part, but so back to 59, I kind of I'm going back a little bit, but um, anyway, Arthur Samuel is kind of the guy who kind of uh, came up with the chess playing uh, and the checkers playing ideas of, of, um, of AI and that became known as machine learning. So this is different, but is a part of AI. So machine learning and AI are not synonymous. They're actually, you know, nested within each other. It's a specialization of artificial intelligence. And what's specific about machine learning, right? It's the fact that the machine then starts to be able to learn without being explicitly programmed these directions, right? So symbolically, symbolic AI where we have these like explicit directions. Now we're finding that we have these, we have these ways to kind of, um, to, yeah, to, have the machine learn very simple rules. We were able to abstract the rules that we were making explicit, right? So in that way that what they're doing is they're adjusting their own weights. They're adjusting their own weights. They have some kind of uh, mechanism to do this. Um, so in short, what I'm saying here is that uh, machine learning is also an optimization problem. So essentially, and this is what this, this here, we'll see here, this, this uh, nice graph here. This is, this, this is what machine learning is. All it cares about is optimization, optimize, 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 and literally cares about nothing else. But, um, and so we have um, like, and so the obvious thing is like, yeah, it makes sense what this is, but this is where we start to hear the words about uh, tuning. So you can tune a model in a very specific sense. Um, and um, here, local minima, minima, global minima. These are objectives to this math function, uh, which is to optimize uh, its performance. Um, and so, Machine learning, basically, whereas symbolic AI is tasked with a specific, specific task to return a specific uh, variable, machine learning is tasked with an objective function, which is to, like, optimize, uh, optimize your ability to uh, do X rule. Instead of do X rule, it's now self-optimized to do X rule better. I guess maybe I can say that. So I think this is very important. It's like uh, these applications, right? They're there to identify patterns, classify data, and it's very restricted because anytime we did not restrict the data set, we couldn't figure out, the, the, it doesn't learn. It, it, there's no way to learn information. Um, it might hallucinate stuff, but you know, there is no aspiration towards human level intelligence in the applications, right? They are just written to do their own thing, but still no, no, none of the, none of this talk here, but. Okay, so what is the learning part of machine learning? 
Again, again, I'm saying it's optimizing along a certain dimension. So you either try to, let's say you have an error. Um, let's say you're, you have a straight line down a road, right? And you have a two wheeled, a two wheeled device that's going down the road and you can control both wheels and you're trying to stay on the straight line, right? So you have a certain deviation from the straight line at every point that you check, am I on the line? And that's like, and we correct for that, right? We would change the direction to kind of steer back onto the line. Essentially, it's the same thing here where it minimizes its own error you know, to its object function. Um, so there are things called, there are three functions that are used um, that are used, uh, and this is where, again, I'm trying to tease out this really weird language because this is again, some people use this, these three as like synonymous, like the same. Some people have specific versions of them. Sometimes the objective function is the error function. It, language and engineering is terrible. It just does it, a lot of times it really screws things up. But again, you have an error function, a loss function, or objective function. They have slightly different meanings. Um, which I think makes sense, right? The error is going to optimize towards its error. The loss is going to optimize towards what it uh, what uh, is worried about um, increasing uh, gain. So it wants to. So it has a um, reward. Um, that's it. Okay. Let me just say, error function is the simple one I told you with the line, uh, where you know where you can say, okay, how far off am I on the line? Okay, that's x off the line. That's my error. Whereas a loss function is there's a there's something of a reward, like if my error is under um, x amount, then I get one. I get one point. If my error is above x amount, then I lose one point. So that's your loss function. And then your objective function is like, can be as simple as like, is this a cat? Yes, it's a cat. Objective function. Okay. It's just that it has an objective, and that doesn't necessarily mean a visual object. It just has a task, right, to do. Uh, but uh, these things are really i know these things are super technical and i promise this is not gonna we're not gonna like spend all day on it but these are things that i just want to kind of cruise through so i can use these words and maybe get away with it later all right so somebody went so when you want to ask so when you want to evaluate how these things are doing that's that's when you ask like what's its objective function because its objective function defines defines the type of machine learning that it is type defines the model some examples right which we've seen pattern detection of course behavioral detection image processing data mining medical diagnosis facial recognition natural language processing but no generation yet right we're still at no generation happening um these things are just basically processing information. Um, here you have a, uh, what I was trying to show a little bit of um, is you kind of have this, this like egg looped formation that I just tried to describe, uh, which your outermost edge here at the edge is uh, your AI, your this is uh, the second most is your machine learning. Then we have something called representation learning and a deeper one called deep learning. And we're gonna spend all of our time here in these next two, these two inner signs. So deep learning is a form of, is a form of also representation learning. We'll have to figure out what that exactly means, but we'll describe that. But you see how we're, this is how, again, the language can get convoluted on what you're talking about when you're talking about AI. Are you talking about artificial intelligence? Because when people say that to me, I'm thinking about that simple if, if then, right? But anyways, that's just, 
that's like my brief introduction into how we got to where we want to be uh, right now for, for this course. Is, right? um, which brings me to the deep artificial neural network, quote unquote, deep learning. Um, the reason why these things are constantly being talked about is that, and they're very new, by the way, that they're like maybe uh, 12 years. It's all, I think 2014 was like the first time that we start to see these things happen. Uh, um, even though essentially, as I explained with, the, with that Churchland diagram, the deep learning concept is already understood in the 50s, right? Just the fact that the technology is not there to be able to compute that amount of information uh, in the 50s, right? Now we have GPUs with like massive processing power, like visual graphics that we use. Um, and this kind of skills uh, approached us to being able to have this, right? So yeah, they're doing very, I mean, they're doing very well at, uh, at, at basically mimicking every skill that we have been doing in the, since since the 50s so they can start to do now deep learning can start to do now uh you know image recognition sound recognition natural language processing um and so it can uh, basically essentially is a step from machine learning it takes over machine learning um except for the only thing that the reason why it's called deep learning is because these hidden layers right are are massive there are a lot of them and we'll start to see why these 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 diagrams get more and more complicated so um this is just like a statistic like if most machine learning algorithms um the machine learning algorithm has a hundred features which is like comprehensible we can think of a hundred different uh, features of a human being, right? Uh, each one has specific values then. Um, like a single, yeah, it says like a single 800 by 1000 pixel image has 2.4 million features. So that's like a, as one single image carries that much more um, in deep. So this is like, um, so, so deep learning um figured out a way through layering to progressively learn information um each layer learns uh, a little bit of information let me show you um, somewhere i have it here Right, so um, here are three different layers of something we're gonna look at a little bit later, but you can see like at the bottom, we're learning very simple features like these hatch lines. We're, we're noticing that there are these black and white lines, different directions, right? And then at the, that information is passed into that next hidden layer. And at that next hidden layer, we can start to represent, we're starting to see from from the um, things that we have on the bottom layer, we can start to then put those together and we can start to see things like eyes and little parts of mouths. And then again, we can progressively learn that those things can be combined and those things can become faces. So this is how these 2.4 million parameters of a single image can be broken down into very simple tasks. Um, and deep learning, this is how deep, this is what deep learning this is the deep of the deep learning is that it breaks down things into their uh, expressively small features um, and that this is what makes it very hard to understand what it's doing unless we literally go through neuron by neuron and 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 map these things like they did here so this is how they start to visualize it so uh, but the most most prominent example that people know about deep learning is actually uh, maybe DeepMind, it's AlphaGo, right? It's a 
the one that came to fruition, B2, two, two champs, two years in a row, um, kind of launched the hype of, of, of deep learning, although it had been kind of important for about two years previous. Okay, so the so we need to start thinking about like what how do you, in order to work with these models, we need to understand what they are and how their structure works. Just like if you're trying to like fix a house, you need to know like the foundation. Maybe you need to know the foundation of the house. You need to know where the weight, you know. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, you just need to know the structure of it. So let's learn about the architecture of the of or schematics of deep learning. All right, well, we've discussed a lot of these things already, which is like what I hope to do. So I can just start to kind of get through them a little bit. Um, and you're going to hear these all the time. These are kind of like this is like your vocabulary, your glossary terms, but. Your feature variables are your measurable properties. So like a feature. It's like a color of an image or like the eye color. I mean, it could be very different on the level of abstraction that it is. It could be curve or not curve, whatever it might be, right? Um, everything is built on these features. So you first need to break down your problem into these features. If your problem is something, you need to think about the things that, um, if your problem is, is this, you're trying to recognize the face, Right, then you need to figure out the features that exist that you can model to a certain amount of accuracy, right? So then you start to place these features. You start to realize that there, you know, there are certain curves that you have to measure. I mean, face recognition has a map uh, of certain points that are feature values that are basically a generic construct that you can that have been developed over years. You also have what's called the learning criteria. So deep learning have different kinds of learning mechanisms. So you're going to hear these a lot. You're going to hear um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, zero shot learning. These are like the four, th really the first three are the three biggest fields. I just want to kind of describe a little bit about the what these three things are. It's important to know these things because when you have a task that you want to do, you're going to need to know like the specific architecture that you need to be able to produce the answer. Because like, and you can do it from different ways too. I mean, I have the obviously my my favorites that I will go, even though they might not be the best. So supervised learning, we have. Um, so in supervised learning. We have a data. We have a we have a training set. We have a certain amount. We have some kind of data that we want the the thing to learn, and with that, there are known labels. So um, the thing is tagged with a certain amount of labels. So the information that the model gets it correlates with a tag. So for instance, it gets X and Y pixel, and it correlates that with like this is the cat's ear. So it will just so the machine learning just re doesn't understand the concept of cat's ear, but knows like, oh, this number correlates with this, right? That's what it knows. It just knows this correlation. Um, and the way that super, it's, it's called supervised uh, because there is this feedback mechanism, which usually is called back propagation, um, which means that it's just everything everything is propagated back through the network in the reverse section as it, it flows through and then it flows back. Um, and so weights, weights get updated and then weights get uh, uh, changed based on its, on its uh, feedback. So why would we use supervised learning, right? Um, really a classification ad, uh, applications are, are always really good for this because we have a certain amount of, for instance, uh, one of the uh, image databases to use would be called like, is uh, I think it's Google's, it's called ImageNet, right? It's a, it's a wide 
trained on a really large amount of data, right? Um, ImageNet has like a hundred categories, thousand categories, it has thousand categories. And those thousand categories were all the labels, right? That were trained, uh, that supervised learning trained. So it knows nothing beyond that though. It will tell you the closest thing that your data exists to those labels, but it won't tell you. So if you have horse, if you have a horse label, but you don't have a unicorn label and you feed it in a unicorn, it's gonna tell you it's a horse. Um, this was one of the reasons why, I mean, this is, okay, what, um, yeah, so anyway, so this for detection and for forecast, for prediction, for pre prediction and detection, both good for both of these problems. Um, so let's go to here to uh, then obviously your next is unsupervised learning, right? Where it's the same thing except for no labels exist. So these, these different, they had to find our different approaches. Well, how do we deal with um, a data set that we don't, that has no labels, just a bunch of data and we don't know what it does. Um, then you need to know other information. This is where like T-Sign uh, goes, comes in, right? Because we can start to like uh, group images. We can start to classify them. Um, we can find relationships between things. Um, so what the, th what the machine does is it, if it's given them a, uh, uh, amount of data is it finds correlations in the data set and the ones that carry the most weight become the ones that it will output the, the most frequent so that's like it's down the, the downfall of, okay so you have supervised learning really good to learn if you only have a limited amount of data of uh, labels right just give it the label if you have a certain amount of genres just give it all the genres there's no reason to do unsupervised learning but if you're like in the real world, a lot of times you don't have that. So you have to start to think of how to do things otherwise, um, how to elicit these, these relationships that exist already in your data set that maybe you have not found. Now, there is a problem with this also because correlations might not make sense. Um, you know, spurious correlations happen all the time. That like, and I think there, there's actually like a really cool uh, post. -it. There's like a funny website that finds, like every month finds really interesting correlations between data sets that have no relation to each other, but they like correlate statistically. Um, final problem, which we can't really get too much into in this class, but I think you'll hear it a lot is reinforcement learning um, and this one's specifically for um, when you can display that, when, when I mentioned uh, the reward function, I was describing reinforcement learning. So the, when you have like a certain action that you can evaluate and you can feedback on, that becomes, uh, you then reinforce, that's why it's called, you then reinforce its action by giving it uh, a reward. So um, it's called, one second, sorry. Mm -mm. Come on. Okay, so you have these these class. These are very simple examples, um, and so the way that reinforcement learning, the one thing that's very interesting about reinforce they uh, that works really well in reinforcement learning is that uh, is like is the mechanism of a game, which is why you'll find a lot of games are easily beaten by reinforcement learning because they basically are this uh, this logic 
where you try something, you die, you restart, you try it again until you beat it, right? That's essentially what reinforcement learning does. Their simplest examples, if you go to that link, are like balancing, it has a certain gravity and basically just keeps learning how to balance based on failing over and over and over and over again until it learns it really well. So that's how it can, yeah, so it can start from uh, complete guesses and as it's it get, based on its reward function, you know, it can then gradually learn. And I think it makes more sense if you actually visit the link at some point uh, to see like the animations of this kind of how it kind of jitters and functions. There's another one that which is like uh, more mm, more specific, but I think is imp uh, interesting that you hear, that you hear a lot about, which is called zero shot learning. Um, and zero shot learning is like if you have so remember how I described that supervised learning and unsupervised learning, right? Is that it was supervised learning? You had a data set with with labels. The other one you have a data set without labels, and this zero shot is somewhere in the middle. It's like you have a trained model that knows some amount of information and then it can uh, observe other data samples and then learn that and not just learn. So I, I mentioned like a supervised learning model would give you horse if you, get, if you inputted unicorn, right? Whereas zero shot learning gets to uh, which starts to um, it's it starts to uh, what's called interpolate. It starts to inter uh, interpolate the information. Um, so, okay, another word try you know the word triangulate. So like when you have like how you triangulate cell towers. But basically, it's a way of taking two data points, you know, and finding um, a path between them. Uh, that and basically every point along that path is uh, can be like a generated data set data point that is outside of your data set. So you can start to like um, you can start to estimate and, and and guess. So this is how they deal with unseen data. So few shot learning, zero shot learning are these ones that are um, kind of. Yeah, try to do it. Um, and then, yeah, so the last thing about this is that this is like, it's to, what to use when you can't use unsupervised learning. People usually fall back on zero shot. Okay, so that's your like three basic, um, four basic uh, learning structures, which we're gonna kind of go over throughout the course. Um, that layer architecture thing should be up up there, but sorry. Um, yeah, then it's important to know that everything in the world of the machine is a number, um, everything. Uh, an image is a set of numbers. Uh, an image is not an image, right? It doesn't, it might give you the word circle back, but it has no idea the shape of a circle, right? It knows a number. So every single thing has to be kind of abstracted down. And we can abstract these down into different dimensional arrays, uh, different dimensions of boxes of information. Right? Text is linear, character driven, and so it's one channel uh, of information, right? It doesn't have, I mean, it could have multiple dimensions, like for instance, we could add a second dimension uh, on the language that kind of gives you a rule to the language, but you can represent text in a one dimensional array. That's important. Um, it's only one dimension, right? You know, and so we have like two dimensions, right? This is obvious, like two dimensions, grayscale image, uh, stereo audio, anything with like two channels, three dimensions. Then we get into RG, we have, RGB, red, red, green, blue, which is like color. Um, you can get, um, yeah, width, height, and the number of channels, which is like your shape, which we'll talk about, um, and multiple 
on audio channels. Then you have four dimension array. And it goes on and on and on and on, right? And this is how every single thing is represented in an, in, in deep learning, um, which makes it really interesting because you can start to then take one model that can encode an amount of information, like can encode an image, and then you can take another model that can encode, I don't know, the any any other amount of data that could be outside of it, like it could encode the Let's see, if you encode an image and then you encode like uh, the emotion on X day, you can actually then build a model that can learn the relationship between these two uh, with deep learning because they have the same uh, architecture and that they all are number. Because they're no longer image and this, they're just like number and number. So, what you start to do is you start to, when you start to bring everything down into an ab this abstraction of dimensions, you could start to, that's why you can start to like relate between text and image. And you can find that a machine can learn the relationship between text and image because you can, you can, you basically represent the information of both things in such a general level. Uh, that they become the same type. How confused is that? Does that make sense? Like th this is what deep learning does. Deep learning takes something um, and massively uh, reduces its dimensions down to something uh, that it can make really easy transfers. I'll try to explain that again and again. But. So, okay. Almost through this, guys. Uh, three main architectures that I want to talk about. And here we have convolutional neural network. Most basic, most fundamental architecture that's used mostly for any visual task because it works much like the human system of vision works. Um, now, you're going to start to see a lot of these kinds of architectures, these kinds of graphs. Pardon me. Um, and uh, this is describing how you basically can take this information down uh, uh, and it, how it gets connected to the network. So, and I, I can show you actually a better. Can you see the convolution? Which one do you see? Yeah. Um, so this is how you know basically um, the function works. And it, and it basically, if you look at the difference between the two images, the one on the left and the right, that's the main features of the image that it, it ends up learning. Right. It ends up. These are the most salient features after convolution. So the network, so what, what this is how it, it ends up running. The network first on the left here, like it'll pick up, it'll pick a, a certain pixel or a certain uh, frame of the image. And it goes through, uh, first learns to detect edges, then from the edges, it detects simple shapes from the shapes, then it can detect high level features like facial shapes, right? Um, and basically, so then, so what this does is it, every single, uh, every single layer is broken down or every single layer is like, it's just a very, it's one task broken into very small parts, integrative objects. Um, When would you use a convolutional neural network? It's when you have uh, an image or an audio file and you're essentially just looking for patterns. When you kind of run an image through a convolutional neural network, this is what you get. You're getting, you're getting um, 
uh, a model that learns patterns. So if you feed it in an image, it's going to tell you the frequency patterns, the amplitude patterns. You know, it's going to find these relationships. Um, so this works really good for detection. Okay. Now we have sequence models. Sequence models are usually used for text or any kind of temporal uh, hierarchy, hi temporal scale, like um, anytime time is involved. So when you have like a sequence of things that matter, like a sentence, right? Words are sequenced in a sentence to create meaning. So we need to then convolutional neural networks. They have no idea of time. It's flat, right? Everything's just flat and relates out to everything. In a sequence model, every character is in a sequence as at a time step, at a certain at a certain time, and that time specifically relates to a larger architecture. Um, you're gonna. So these are law like uh, what is called L. STM, long short term memory, uh, which is just the basic model that we'll go, go over that can, it basically, it does what it says. It can learn over a long period of time, uh, short repetitive examples of sequences. So this is a very simple text. Uh, you wanna figure out a person's text style, like how they write. Right, you could feel, you could you could use a, a, a long term, long short term memory um, model in order to um, to learn the frequencies of words that I use in my writing, to learn the probabilities that I would use this word after this word, right? Or if I use X after Y, and this is why. So then you could start to type a sentence in, hi, my name is, and it should know that it's looking for it. what, then it knows that, yes, hi, my name is, right, in that order, in that linear order, it can then predict what the next word, the next character, the next sentence, giving you what you want. It can start to predict that out. And this is how we start to get text generation uh, in deep learning. We have other ways of doing it, but this is how deep learning starts to do text generation. And um, I think uh, not this week, but the next week I'll have an example of that to run for you um, outside of class. Um, so yeah, this works a lot for things like video, right? Which is like images in time. Um, translation, language, understanding, and these things. Um, and I noticed that natural language understanding is not the same as uh, natural language processing, right? Um, understanding knows some semant some semantic, and by that I mean like some kind of sense about the stru overall structure of it. Um, so you start to see this model of here, which not fully orange. Okay, start to see this model here, which is um, this is where we start to get into somewhat interesting, or at least what will be interesting stuff when we can run it. But we start to get into here the encoder and the decoder, and this is how, and you see how this is like also linearly directed. Each one of these. Um, Boxes here are representing um, like a like a like a set through time. If I said that every good boy does fine in my sentence, then each one of these would represent either the character or the word itself, depending on how we're representing it. Um, but basically, what what you start to do here is we started to train encoders to we tried we started to train what we called encoders and decoders encoders had a some way um that it could take your in, that it would take uh, a specific input 
and it, it couldn't encode it into um, that, like what I meant when I mentioned the one dimensional array, this two dimensional array of text, blah, blah, blah. Um, it will encode it into that. Um, it's usually, it's a singular dimension. Um, but it knows this abstract uh, information that you could then train a decoder to learn the information. It just, it's very simple, um, it's a lot simpler than, like is it, it is as simple as you think it is with the, but the math is the difficult part. But you'll start, to, like this is where we're at the verge of, we're almost there, but we're at the verge of the generative networks. Now, I'm sorry that it took so long to get here, but we're here. Um, so what makes these the, the, the generative networks different? And we're gonna go back and look at what I encoded, uh, the encoder stuff, but you have a, so, um, yeah, so these are, they're normally called GANs, right? Uh, and they can generate synthetic media that look authentic to, um, to us. We can't represent, we normally can't tell the difference. This is where you get the deep fake, right? And all these things. Um, and the way that they do that is, was heavily influenced by um, guy game theory. So this is kind of, this is, this is the global model for what a GAN is. So like, like game theory where you had um, cops and robbers kind of uh, um, playing, you have a, what is called a generator, generative network and a discriminative network. And the, and so basically um, what you have here is that you have at the, at the lowest level, okay, so you start to feed it like essentially noise at this level, uh, which goes through a generative network, which can then generate fake images. Those fake images are inputted into a, what it's called a discriminator, and the discriminator is supposed to tell that it's fake. And the way that they've, they've kind of now, so the, the, what is like, revolutionary about this idea is that they train the generator and the discriminator at the same time. So they, they train the generator to make more and more realistic images as the discriminator make is better and better at detecting it. So they basically push each other to get better each time, right? Because it becomes harder and harder to detect or to, to detect an image. Um, and, and so they found that like through this process of training both, um, they could actually, um, you could then after these models are trained, you basically take the generative network and you could use the generative network as itself like an object to, to generate images. You would no longer need the discriminator. So when you see these things like deep fakes, they're trained like this, and then essentially the generative network is, is outputting things. The way that you can, so, um, and then if you were to use the discriminative network in an application, um, that would be like, so to use a discriminative uh, discriminator, Discriminative network, it would be like um, it's uh, how to no, it's inversing the generative. Network. You can actually sorry not to use a discriminative network. The only way you would use the discriminative network is to detect to detect faked images. You could use that as your model, but you could actually inverse the process of the generative network, which means you can go uh, the reverse way um, and. Um, so come from a synthetic image and it should be able to give you, uh, again, it's input, it should be able to go back to its input images. So you should be able to give you my image and it should be able to give you, or it, I should be able to inverse the network and it will give me uh, uh, an image where I exist in, in its model. This is how facial, this is how deep fakes are 
are built. They're, they're built through that generative network. Um, so it's like the most powerful way. And I'm going to share these with you. So I'm skipping all of the, a lot of the tech stuff, but there are two. Okay. So I, I gave you a global description. So now there are two very common used models. And what, and so one is called the, the very, uh, very, or just an autoencoder, but usually you'll hear this variational autoencoder. And that goes back to this idea of the encoder and the decoder, except for we're letting them train in a similar way uh, as, the, as the generative network. So what it is, is, is it's quote, a probabilistic graphical model uh, rooted in Bayesian inference, which is also saying the same thing. It's basically, it's a model that works based on probability. So it's, it's a statistical model. And it learns what it aims at is it it doesn't aim to learn like specific things. It just wants to learn like the underlying general flow of things. So it does really good at kind of like generalizing a thing or a set, but it knows nothing about the specifics of the information. So you could learn, for instance, like very well the underlying probability of a video, um, but it's not going to give you any kind of high quality information. You're not gonna see like a very good video. Uh, it only uh, understands some kind of like really general um, landscape of the data. Um, So yeah, the failure of the of of the variational autoencoders is that they can't generate sharp images, um, so it can't learn any kind of true distribution. So, um, but autoing, but these in, uh, these encoders are very good for generalizing information. So you find that they're kind of used uh, later on. That's as a as a thing. But you'll always hear uh, variational autoencoder GANs. When you're describing these two, when you're describing generative models, so the two majors. Um, so now we have the uh, so now we have the GANs, right? The, and I didn't describe or I didn't highlight uh, this idea of the adversary, uh, but I did talk about that a little bit when I described game theory, right? But. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to describe here is this is the most important word of the whole thing, probably. Um, so what the generator network does is it takes in a quote unquote latent space vector. So what this means and I have an image actually to describe this. Sorry, bear with me a moment. Okay, this is a latent space. This is how it's a latent space is represented. And the, the black line going through the latent space is that vector that I, am just, that I was just defining um, that is input to the generator. So the model itself knows this entire space the generator gets this line of information, okay? And 
so um, what is important about these space what about it's important about this space that it takes very high dimensional very complex information and um, it manipulates the representation of the data and that's why you kind of get this weird folded image um, but you see uh, you'll see like examples of of generative algorithms kind of putting out image after image after image like it, it looks like an animation that's that's tracing each point along this line because each point along this line is an image so this is how you kind of uh, explore the these generative models um, you have to bait you have to so the thing we, we will have to learn is how to how to get our in, get our data into this this, this uh, format, this representation. Okay, so I kind of have a note here about conditional generative networks, um, just because like, uh, they're probably the, the one that's used the most um, and without the conditional, you could only generate random information. So without the conditional model, I could only generate random images. But if I condition the model, I could then generate random images of, you know, a uh, boy with blue hair or these kinds of things. I can actually condition the model based on a genre. So I can say, give me the text of X genre. And I can, so I basically, it's when you can start to, um, you can set, pre, you can precondition, uh, you go into the data and you tell the model, you see this, uh, this, this grouping of data, that is X. And then it will, that's how basically you condition the model by naming it. Um, so now, usually when you trained a machine learning or artificial intelligence, you had to have a big trove of data, large amounts of data. And nowadays, not so much. Uh, nowadays, we actually can synthesize, we can actually synthetically create data. We can learn real world actions based on a virtual world. Um, and so, but we can also learn on very, very small amount of data. Uh, and, and these and these methods work really well. That's why that's why these things become important because they start to start to be able to abstract away from the need to have huge amounts of data. However, it makes it extremely non trivial, extremely hard to, to control these things, to train them, to tune them. Um, they have what are called hyperparameters and hyperparameters are exactly what you think, just like deep learning. If deep learning is just like a, a, a massive depth of layers, uh, hyperparameters is a meta, meta representation for all of the different things that you can change basically it's your input for it's your input variables and you can then so when people are talking about tuning a model what they're doing to tune uh, apologies what they're doing to tune a model is um adjusting what is called hyperparameters um and those hype so for instance i mean this is very simple i mean like for instance if i'm trying to generate an audio file some of the hyperparameters would be like how many, um, how, what is the length that I want the thing to be? Like, so yeah, they're just like thing options that are able to be tweaked. And that's like what tuning is. So that's like, if you have a model uh, and this, so, um, which brings me to like 
why we can use these things uh, quite easily. Um, because nowadays, like these things are, so the way that a, a model, uh, the way a model generally develops is by, it's usually developed with a lot of money in industry and then industry releases the model for free which then goes to like academics and researchers and those people like change the model and develop it. Then it goes to people like us, like also like GitHub users, random people who like might go in and like do some other thing to it, which then gets fed back into the, the uh, industries. And that's how like these, these kinds of uh, images or these knowledges kind of like exchange. So we have access right now to most of state-of-the-art models that we can run off the bat without anything. But we can then tune a model to be uh, particular to our needs. What do I mean by that? I mean, I can use a, I can use a pre-trained language model that generates films, that generates film scripts, for instance, like, really really great film scripts and oh um no sorry it's a lot of talking without the with the, just the, in pure silence so i'm starting to like unravel a little bit but um If I have a film script model, which it does exist, I want to train it on a specific set of uh, David Lynch films. I could then tune it to know that, that uh, specific uh, information. And the way that what you're doing is you're basically manipulating You're, you're manipulating only the top most layer of information. All the other stuff that's already been trained is going to be ingrained in your model, but it's going to just, you can adapt the top level model to basically, um, it is John Nash. I don't know if it's John Nash or a beautiful mind to be honest. I'm not quite sure, it's a mathematician, I know this. I haven't seen a beautiful mind in a long time. Sorry. Um, that tangent screwed me up. But yeah, so you can basically tune a model and we're gonna learn how to tune a model. Um, and we're gonna learn how to do a lot of those things. Um, okay, I want to take a quick like quick break just so I can breathe for a second. Then we're, I'm gonna come back and try to have a discussion. I know I just blasted you guys a lot of stuff. I did tell you it's gonna be very boring for the first, you missed that, you came in early. Or you came in late, but I said it was going to be boring. I already told you this, this first session. I promised you that. So um, let's take a five minute break, five minutes, and we'll come, or let's do 10, just come back at the, at the hour and we'll, we'll do the last, we'll do the last uh, part of the session together. Yeah. Okay. Come back at the hour.
if we can start coming back. Let's give it like a minute or two. Okay. Um, okay, so that's like the most so the, out of the lectures that you'll get out of me on any day is like just that. The rest of it, I want to kind of work, will work, the, the rest of the sessions will work more collaboratively. Uh, just always get a lot of that out of the way. Um, but like those are, essentially the basics the basic concepts that we need to know that we can start to um dissect these different types of models we can start to learn about them and we can try to to get into them a little bit better um i am posting on the chat here like a link uh like because this is like a coding thing i'm kind of uh i'm, I'm offering like just put in like whatever free time, like some free times that you have maybe on the, for just this, I only put it for one week, but we'll keep it for the, but like if you wanted to like have a free one hour or two hour session, we could like go into a discord chat or something and we could talk about the codes like in between the sessions, uh, just put down any of the time. If we can find some times at work, I, I don't mind, you know, spending some extra time um but um and i i want to and i'll give you um actually yeah I'll, let's talk about that right now i get let's just talk about like what kind of like what what, what we can expect to do over the next before before um the next session so let me just pull up the Sorry. Okay. Um, so one second. I hate the screen share. Suck it. There. Okay, so this is a syllabus. So um, everyone has like a ton of readings. I don't expect you to do all of them, of course. Um, they're just there for you if you want, if you find that you're interested in a topic, because I'm trying to give you a little bit more to go into. But I tried to give at least one theoretical, one technical paper. Um, and I wanted to make a little bit of some comments really quickly about like how to read these. The, tech, the theoretical ones, um, I give at least two of them in each session, I think. And I want you to kind of choose which one you're more interested in reading to spend time to finish at least one of them. Um, we'll talk about both, but I, I don't expect you to kind of read too much every week um, while coding. But these kind of bring up some interesting ideas. Uh, that kind of that we can kind of actually have real discussions about um, the theoretical parts. I think now the technical parts are there for you to kind of get a historical mention, but also I kind of want to go over how to read these kind of technical documents. So the technical documents, I ex I, I would expect you just to like look through them, but not really to like expect to like study them. So like just read them a little bit. Read like the abstracts and the and uh the abstract like the summary of it but don't worry about like getting into the math or any of these things but these first two technical texts are, are actually really good they're like the original the original article on generative adversarial networks um 
kind of gives you the whole um, take on it, which is a really good one. And then there's kind of like a recent uh, text that I gave you, which is like a review over like a lot of these models. So a lot of like what I already talked about too. Um, and then again, supplemental ones are just like extra things that I think are also quite interesting. So like the other Mateo ones I assigned for this, um, you know, are interesting, but you may not want to spend too much time on them. Um, and the readings are there for you. Um, they're really there for you just to kind of like pull whatever you'd like out of them. Um, I'm going to, after the next session, I'm going to like ask that, I'm gonna probably ask for like a small reflection so we can actually have discussions about them. But um, I would say for the first one, uh, and I'll write this up on the classroom, but for the first, for the first one, I just want um, to prepare some, a small response to one of the theoretical texts, like as a comment, so we can um, start a, a dialogue about these things. Um, I think the Mateo text is really interesting. It would give you a lot of the historical context and also like a really good critical theory into why the models are not uh why the models are not actually what we may be talking about them that they're there are a lot of uh yeah there are a lot of because they're based on statistical inference or probability like i described he kind of comes to some really interesting conclusions that i would like that i find interesting to discuss uh, and then the hit to stereo one is great from the visual concepts, but it also goes over um, <clears throat> it also goes over like uh, the deep dream algorithm and uh, what it means what it means for a computer to hallucinate, or if that's even the correct term that we should be using, and why. Um, that's, a, in my opinion, one of the best texts on this stuff. There's not many good theor theory yet kind of out there. I think it's just being written. Um, so like, yeah, uh, so we'll have like these kinds of uh, these kinds of readings. The readings are meant for kind of like your own information. Like I said, uh, we'll have slight amount of response to it, but um, I kind of want these kinds these things to kind of color our discussions. So I hope we can pull them in. Um, the second thing will be, and I have this is not in the syllabus. I will post I will post that to the classroom. I think everybody uses this classroom, right? Um, and it will be a notebook. I'll show you. Okay. Um, is it showing the code, right? Yeah. Okay. This is like you'll get a file link like this. This is how we can run code and get used to it. But this is like a very beginner. Um, you know, I just kind of want to briefly go through um, how this works. If you have a Google account, all should be good. Everything should be running. Um, and you should have here uh, this question mark if you, or this check mark. If you don't have the check mark like this, it'll look like that, right? Okay. So I want to make sure that I'm connected to the server. And just to give you a look at this, like normally this would be in one full block of code that you would just run but you can individually run and see each part um like we're going to use this library called torch i don't know if that's it's it's all, all it is is a library that contains 
functions that we can use, uh, that we can call. We can call operations that are built into this library so we don't have to write the, write the code. So like, I wanna import it. I hit the play button. No error comes out. There's a, a nice little number telling me that it ran. That's how you run the code. I can run it. Um, so this describes um, like how uh, how you process information. And this is like a, some of these things are very difficult. And how much I can explain to you, um, and how much I just have to give you to understand so you can run the code. But this is a technical way um, that the comp computation happens. Um, it's called tensor. That's why there is the code. That's why there is something TensorFlow, uh, which is another library. I think TensorFlow is mostly is like a developed by Google. I think PyTorch was developed by Facebook or something. But they're essentially the same thing. They just are different uh, libraries. This so this all this is doing is basically processing a number. So I'm creating what is called a tensor, which is a which is an object that the soft that the compute comp, that the uh, what the thing that processes the code, right, takes uh, this this data this representation of a tensor, right. So we have to put everything into that. So if this is just how it knows a digit number four. So I, I try, I'm try I try to describe out each step for you here, right. So that's just a digit, right. Um, I don't even want to get into that. That's, that's um, yeah. So this is like a list, a list of tensors. So now we have the one, two, three, and four a matrix. A matrix is is is, is just a like an a, like a Excel file. But anyways, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you about the code. I'm just trying to show you the, the, the interface for now. You can run something. Uh, let's say I have an error in my code. So I call like, and I run it. Now I have my error. Um, so as long as you're not getting any errors, you can essentially run the code all the way through and it should show you all of uh, your answer. Now, let me show you like something slightly more interesting. This is like one of my latest projects that I like a lot that we're working on. Um, so this one is going to take a little bit longer to run, but I'm just going to get it running real quick. Okay. Um, so you can, so uh, I'm loading all the information. It takes a little bit to run. And then um, I get to this point here where I start to have to uh, give it information. So right now I'm running it through uh, Borges imaginary uh, beings, parts of it. And I'm kind of just, this is like the description of, of the text. Um, and then I'm kind of uh, building a prompt here. Um, I know it doesn't matter what it is, but basically what I'm doing is I am, I'm telling it um, these here, these, these strings of text, I'm telling it these, uh, I'm telling it to read these things and to visualize them. 
uh, by prompting it to the model, right? Um, so that's how I'm just doing here. Almost there. It runs there. And then the code should run. Okay, so now here is each step is it is is that is is going to be trying to now start to to um, be the imaginary beings. Um, specifically, my input. Let's go over my input. My main prompt is just saying "book of imaginary beings," and it's just gonna. Tr it, it just gets that text and tries again with that model clip, like I said. Um, and I'm and I give it these <clears throat> minor uh, language here say like uh they're more descriptive and um and i i mentioned and i mentioned that you can weight things differently right so the way that i i broke down the prompt is that i have different versions or different parts of prompts like the main text the descriptive text and then the third one and each one is a different each one weighs the uh, algorithm differently and it's not like there's no right way to do that. That just is like the creative aspect. So we can see how where it's good, where it's going. So I mean, like this is like it's trying to do that. It's um, trying to visualize this very basic thing, book of imaginary beings and the reason why it's why it starts is because i initialize it here with this image which is just an image of noise so essentially it is looking for the feature in the noise and that's why we're having the that's why you can see it kind of uh pull up each time And so it also has, go ahead, no. I'm sorry, Tony, but there is a question from Georgia on the chat. Ah, oh, sorry, my chat is off. Um, it's okay, my question was what uh, data set is this model trained on? Or is yes, it so remember I mentioned clip, right? I mentioned the clip model to you. Um, So um, it's the prompt is based on this model um, that like correlates the images to the or the text here and the image. So again, here is a text encoder and an image encoder, and we see that we can then they basically um, then here's the labeling data up top and the prediction data. So. Here it can basically, uh, it's not, this is not quite a GAN, but it's a generative algorithm that works more like these encoders. Um, and um, so then basically what the, the, this part of the model does is I gave it the text, the book of imaginary um, beings. Uh, and it basically, um, let's see if I can find it. Like, okay, so see here how it's, how I can, it can basically um, rate the different things here. Um, it's because it's based on this giant model that it knows it, it can represent the, the, the relationship between image and uh, text. And then there's a second model. Uh, which I guess I could just call it Dolly. Okay, which is the opposite, which creates images. Or now this one creates images from text too. Uh, but this is the image generator. So this one can actually generate images um, on text. So it's a two-step process. So what I'm doing is I'm inputting 
Let me show you again. Okay, here I'm imp I, I input the prompt. Right, and that prompt. That prompt creates, where is it? It's up here. None of the stuff that I would give you is this complicated. I'm just kind of giving you a better visual example right now. But um, I can, cr basically I'm creating, uh, I create a loss check. So what it does is it gets the image and it gets the text and it relates that, it gets a big loss number obviously at the beginning because my image is pure noise. So it has no, it basically is, means nothing. And the reason why you can gradually build is because it's basically optimizing that loss function as it goes. Um, but there's like an artistic twist to the, to the generation, like in that you can see I'm, I'm, I'm zooming in on the image. Um, you can see it better when I make it a video, but I actually am moving the image at, at each point of the generation. But like, so like um, I, what I think is really interesting about this aspect of it is that like, um, this is very plug and play. Uh, it's like very much like can be anything um, like um, let's say Humphrey Bogart is an actor. It does really well at um, cultural things because it's trained on the internet. So I'm just gonna put in Humphrey Bogart in Blade Runner and see what it gives me. So let's see. So like this one's a little, I've been working on this, this, this kind of program for a while, but like we can do things at a little bit of a, a more basic example, but so I put in Humphrey Bogart in Blade Runner and let's see what we can get. You can start to see it like the resemblance, he's coming in a little bit there and there. So what I find interesting about these things is you can start to put in cultural references and you can start to find which ones have more salient information, which ones exist inside the model. So there's a lot of, there's a lot to like not even having access to the internalization of the model, but being able to just be able to run it like this. See, I mean, like you can see that's definitely a likeness of, of, of him. Um, they don't get super realistic because of the quality of the image. But this is the kind of platform we're going to be running code on. Um, I have like five minutes, shit. Um, I'm sorry, I this is, it went too long. But let me just talk in the last five minutes about uh, the better, the big, the thing I think is find more interesting is what I want you all to do throughout these four weeks, right? Um, and I will put it in the chat, just, just the points is like, the way I'm kind of framing it is 
coming up with these two things over the oh, prop, hopefully over the next week to come to with a general idea of a project. So if you have a question, I would like you to break it down into like these two, these two things, like a context and an index. And all I mean there is like a general theme or or question uh, for one, which from like mine uh, is like my my question is what is the relationship between the collaboration collaboration between us and the, and the models like what kind of access can we get and what kind of this is like my my contextual question right and then the second one that we should think of is like the index question which is like um is like your data set so like um I have a specific, like I want to work on, I have a specific data, data points that I'm working on, uh, which could be like something with the COVID virus. Uh, and I'm, I have COVID uh, information for this month and I want to work with this data. So this is my indexical information. This is my data that relates to real world information. So if you can come up with, and I'll, I'll formalize this by tomorrow, post it on classroom. But what we're trying to come up with is like, for you, what is your general idea or theme? And what is the data that you think you can bring to it? And from there, we'll start to build uh, a project that we can do in, in three sessions. Um, and, I'll, and I'll give you an example of it in the class as well, or in the classroom, uh, in the document. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of yeah, I'll provide that all to you by tomorrow morning. So tomorrow morning is for me, Eastern Standard US. So you should all have it tomorrow and be able to do it. But if you need me, I don't know, either Discord or email or anywhere, somewhere, just get a hold of me. Um, fill out that doodle because we can have extra session if you want to do uh, to learn or to accelerate the coding. Um, but then, and I will give you a good prep on for the next session, um, how to what to come in with because we're going to do some next session. We're going to go. We're going to jump. We're going to try to jump right in with a coding example. We'll talk a little bit about about the readings, and we'll finish with the project based coding example. Um, it's my first time trying to teach a coding class over video, so I'm okay if you want to give me feedback like, "Hey, this really sucked. I can't stand this." That's fine. I don't. I don't have. A, I don't take offense. Or it was really good. I don't understand to do that. But um, you know, really, if it's like I can't understand what you're saying when you're doing this, then I'll. I will adjust you whatever works better. So. Um, to make the sessions fun and interesting. Uh, and I'll try to get, and I like to get uh, questions generated, some, some ideas or stuff generated on the classroom. So, and, I, and I've had experiences where some classes use it a lot, some don't. So we'll find out which one that will be here. Are there any questions, um, concerns? problems the session sign up on doodle you're just looking for blocks of time to possibly just, take us through if, some coding if you have a free time just put whatever free time you might have and if we can find some overlaps that's great um yeah just any time you can put one out a one hour slot a 30 minute slot it doesn't have to be anything you know just for me to gauge like where everybody's at because we're global but know that the time zone is Eastern Standard. Any other questions for now? No, okay. Next session is gonna be more interactive and more fun. Um, thanks for everybody taking the course. I'm very excited about it. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you like 
Yeah. Sorry, I might have a question on the doodle since it uh, seems that you can only choose a day and not a time slot. Or maybe I'm just entering it wrong, but. Uh... Um, let me check it. So for me, it shows more or less whole days. Oh, yeah, damn it. No, wait, if you click on count. Um... Oh, God damn. Yeah, I screwed. It. All right, I'm going to send out another one. All right. Because the day, yeah, that won't work. But I'll thank you for telling me. I'll send out another one. I'll post it on the classroom and then we'll do that there. And I'll make sure it has like blocks of time that you can choose instead of this. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. Well, then. I uh, think so Tony, uh, sorry, I will have uh, some technical uh, questions about um, our presentations and presenters and responders. Would you like to do that on uh, this seminar? So we're going to do. Um, yeah, I was, um, so the, like I, I the, um, okay. So I was, I was trying to figure out how to, how we can do that, but we can, like the last class I did it where I, we were just like people volunteered for the weeks, um, to like give a short presentation on the. On, on a reading, but the readings I'm not, I need to respond in a, to the classroom. Is that okay? okay let me think, let me think yes, for, sure, sure. Let me, because, because, uh, yeah, we are, I, I always, I always do it slightly different, but like, yeah, we're like the response, I think the responses we're, we're going to have are more uh, question based that I'm going to post on the classroom. But I, I will answer that within the next, I'll, I'll post it tonight. So we can get that uh, that thing taken care of for you. And I'll let you know too on the WhatsApp or whatever. Are you, you're on the WhatsApp, yeah, you are. Any questions? Yeah, about the, the, the final project, would be uh, an essay, what is usually done in the, at the new center or would be a, a, a coding project. That is up to you. I want to make that up to you all because of the level of coding. So the way that like I've done these things like really fast projects would be like to have a pretty strong conceptual version of it, like a speculative version of it. Um, and we're going to kind of try to build bottom up to see how far we can get building the code to prove that concept. So they're going to be like project based, like, yeah, that it won't be like a writing assignment at the end. It'll be like, a, I mean, it might be a writing assignment if there's like no coding to it, if it's like thinking about the coding instead of doing it. So there'll be like one or the other. I think it could go on the level of like, we should be able to like do as much code as we can and then and then be able to like you know write about uh, where we thought it, where we where we think it could go or so that way there's a lot of substance to the projects like even if it's very minimal code so i'll try to i'll try to tonight just uh, summarize these these kind of questions. I'll give you uh, the things I told you about uh, so we don't have any questions. Um, and I'll see you next week. Yes? All right. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.